Hi, I'm Bryce Crittenden. Hi, I'm Caroline Land, and welcome back to EPL's Overdue Fines. Caroline, how are you today? Um, I'm a lot of things today, Bryce. I'm excited to be here recording the podcast. I'm really looking forward to talking about this topic with the guests that we have today. But also, yesterday, it was announced that Alex Trebek had died. And that's, I find that quite sad because he's been such a part of of people's lives including mine yeah so I, I'm, I'm starting the podcast off on a downbeat today thinking about Alex Trebek yeah I assume I we've touched on Jeopardy just a few times in the past on the show were did you watch it growing up then or and did you still continue to watch it as as an adult yeah, I did. We definitely watched it in our house growing up. I'm always interested to know if people where they lived, if it went Wheel of Fortune, then Jeopardy, or Jeopardy, then Wheel of Fortune. I grew up in a Wheel of Fortune, then Jeopardy situation. Bryce, do you remember what yours was? Sure do. Ours was Jeopardy, then Wheel of Fortune. Oh. And we rarely ever watched Wheel of Fortune. It would be like Jeopardy would come on, we would watch that. Yeah. And then it would be flipped up. My parents would flip it over to like MASH rerun or mm-hmm. <laughs> something like that. I mean, we've talked about this too on the show before. Like, I love trivia. I love kind of these little tidbits. And definitely for me as well, kind of growing up, Jeopardy played such a huge kind of part of my life. And I loved, especially when I was younger, being able to answer some of the questions on the show. That was that was always a big highlight to me. And I don't think it was until I was older that I actually realized that Alex Trebek was uh, was Canadian. So yeah, definitely he a was. huge, huge loss for not only Canadians, but everyone. Yeah, he uh, was born in Sudbury, which is not too far from where I'm from in Ontario. And then he went to the University of Ottawa before starting his broadcasting career in the States. He just became such a pop culture figure. You know, he also guest star on one of my favorite episodes of the X-Files, which was a like a twisty recounting of an alien encounter. And one of the men in black was Alex Trebek. And that was intentional so that when you were recounting the account of the men in the man in black being Alex Trebek, people would say, oh, this person clearly was, you know, intoxicated or or they've had their mind scrambled or something like that. He also, you know, he was a character on Saturday Night Live. I think, you know, he will just be someone that's that's really missed. Yeah, I also think it was... I don't know how to put it. I was talking to Cheryl about this yesterday and how it's, I don't know if it's funny or sad or kind of a combination of both, but we also lost, of course, Sean Connery like last week or the week before. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, uh, for any of those SNL fans, you've, I'm sure you've all seen those famous celebrity Jeopardy clips where Alex Trebek played by Will Ferrell is, is going to going toe to toe with uh, Sean Connery played by Daryl Hammond. Yeah. And um, it's just, you know, I don't know how to explain it, but it's just kind of interesting to see that, um, you know, for both of those icons to kind of go within a couple of weeks of each other. Yeah. So I think we've, you know, we've, I've successfully started this episode on a really depressing <laughs> note, thinking about our own, uh, mortality. And, uh, but, you know, it also does tie in a little bit to what we are talking about today and the idea of Canadiana and television. Absolutely. And a big part of that, too, uh, we've almost seen a resurgence, if you will, of Canadian TV, thanks to a little little show by the name of Shit's Creek, which is what we're going to be chatting about today. Not only Shit's Creek, but also Canadian TV in general, uh, some of our favorite Canadian uh, shows, and also maybe... Uh, we're going to touch, I think, Caroline, on a little bit of maybe why some people, such as myself, are a little hesitant towards some Canadian TV and kind of the stereotypes around that stuff. And joining us today to chat all about 
Shit's Creek and some of our favorite Canadian shows is uh, official friend of the show guest on our uh, time loops episode. And she's also the manager of our Strathcona branch, Katie Terzanski. Katie, welcome back to Overdue Finds. How are you today? Thank you. I'm well. I'm happy to see that time is moving in one direction for us today. <laughs> uh, I hope we can keep moving steadily forward. Last time I was here, we got a little bit stuck. So this is good Ooh. so far. Yeah, so far so good. Knock yeah. on wood, we are not <laughs> stuck in a time loop at the beginning of this episode. Mm-hmm. So. so I need to ask you, Katie, you were nodding your head. You went um, Jeopardy Wheel of Fortune? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Jeopardy Wheel of Fortune. I would watch it um, with some regularity with my grandmother, and she was all about Wheel of Fortune. And she thought I was some kind of a super genius because I did very well compared to her with her limited language skills and no North American cultural upbringing. When it came to the Jeopardy question, she thought I was amazing, even though really I wasn't. But she was like, you should be on the show every time we watched it. So uh, (laughs) another fun Jeopardy fact is uh, a former EPL staff person was on the show and did actually reasonably well uh, last year, I think it was. Yep. Uh, Charlie Jorgensen worked at EPL until he moved away and he was on the show and in fact did his is like testing you have to do in the application process while he was here. Wow. That's, that's so awesome. I had no idea about Mm -hmm. that. That's cool. Just mentioning growing up watching it. That was something too, as I kind of got into my teens, it's funny because I only did really good though on the like sports and entertainment, like pop culture questions. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I remember at one point being like, okay, how can I be a contestant on Jeopardy? I would get absolutely destroyed. But it was something I was like, I actually researched it a little bit and realized it probably wasn't going to happen for it's, me. It's a significant process. And mm. I would much rather have my, whatever my rate is, I've never calculated it, but I'm sure it's something like 10% success rate sitting on my couch at home than to be there live and like be in negative value. No, no thanks. That's not for me. <laughs> well, and have yeah. to worry about the buzzer too. Yeah. Because that yeah. they say, all the insiders say that that's such a, a factor and the success on the show. Yeah, no, I read an article. I don't remember which site it was on. It was a few years ago. And uh, same thing. Yeah, it was like a lot of it has to do with the buzzer timer and it takes takes some time to definitely get used to it. So yeah. a little bit of Jeopardy uh, info to start off today's episode, I guess. <laughs> oh, we're giving the people what they want, Bryce. That's exactly. like, this is what they come to overdue fines for. Definitely. So before we start talking about Shit's Creek, let's move into some of our recent overdue finds. Katie, what have you been enjoying lately? I have been binging, not for the first time, The West Wing. It has been my response to experiencing the current American election, which the day that we're recording this, it was just called two days ago. So in the midst of all of this, uh, we at our house have been deep into the West Wing, which of course is the f- the show that follows the fictional administration of President Bartlett. And uh, it's sort of follows there the political intrigue and the various wild events that of course would happen to the, anybody working in the White House and all of the things that they have to balance and work through. Um, definitely a nerdy kind of show, but it's been a nice, it's a nice antidote to the anxiety around American politics that we're all experiencing. Uh, and we have all seven seasons in our collection at EPO. So Katie, I have to ask how far along into the series are you? Well, okay, so we had been watching it uh, earlier in the year and took a break. And so we were already halfway through and we're now uh, well into season six, which is the second last season. And so they're ending, they're nearing the end of the of the administration. And so there we're now looking towards another election. So it's been kind of nice to be going through this fictional election as sort of a parallel to watching the the real life election going on in the States. Do you have a favorite character on the West Wing or does it change? It changes. Like, I mean, I love all of them. I love President Bartlett. And I just, I think he keeps the, and that's of course uh, Martin Sheen. And I think that he just keeps that show. He's the heart of that show. And then he's just has 
um, interesting characters around him that are funny and smart and all of these things. But I think it's his heart that keeps the show moving forward. Of course, the West Wing too. It's been spoofed on so many shows where it's the the walk along where yeah. shows them going through going through the White House and it's like one person's walking and another person comes up and is like, "Quick, we need to we need to release a we need to have a press release on this uh, on on this uh, this event that's going on." So. Yeah, I imagine you've seen your fair share of those uh, walk There's lots, lots of walking. In fact, I recently read an article about the West Wing where one of the actors was saying that it didn't really need acting because you were so busy balancing the stresses of having to walk up and down the stairs and see who was coming at you and grab this piece of paper that you presented with the, the level of urgency you needed to without actually trying to. Caroline, how about you? What have you been enjoying lately? I recently read a book uh, called Big Stories About Life in Plus Size Bodies, which was edited by Christina Myers. And it was a collection of essays that are mainly based on life experiences of, quote, being large in a world obsessed with thinness. And so there were a number of uh, contributors to this collection, many of them women. I think there were a couple men, as well as non-binary and trans uh, trans writers writing about their experiences with their bodies, how they felt about it, how that maybe has changed over the course of their life, looking at the difference between size and health, as well as body, the, the concepts of body positivity, and even one of them touched on uh, body neutrality. Uh, and so there were a collection of, of voices reflecting these different perspectives. Uh, using the title phrase, I have been big my entire life. And my experience was definitely reflected in some of these essays. And it was really great to, to read those and to see myself in them. But it was also really neat to see where my experience wasn't the other kind of things that people had experienced or, or things I hadn't considered. And really just to, to read more about the topic and have uh, an openness about size, health, where it touches on society at large. I don't like that, <laughs> but we'll leave it in there <laughs> um, because it's true. And it goes beyond just being, um, you know, something, an, an, an academic thought that people write about to being a, a really important factor in how people live their lives. So yeah, it was, it was a collection of stories with a lot of voices that I hadn't hadn't read before nice well that sounds like a that sounds like a great great collection is it a newer book or is yeah. it been out a while i think it was published either earlier this year or the end of last year it's uh newly available at the edmonton public library yeah i i took it out but i've returned it so my copy's back in circulation if anyone else wants to check it out that's cool no it's it's great i uh uh, getting to hear about all those uh, different experiences that people have and body self-acceptance is, is so important. And that's, that's great to hear that people are writing about it and people can connect with those type of stories. Absolutely. And where that goes in kind of with an intersectional lens around, you know, uh, money and economics, uh, race, gender, everything that, that goes along with image. So yeah, it's, it's a book I think people should check out. How about you, Bryce? What have you been enjoying lately? <laughs> uh, I've been watching a lot of movies lately and I'm not going to recommend this movie, but it ties into <laughs> my pick. So of course, a lot of people, like, a couple of weeks ago when it premiered on Amazon Prime, we're all talking about – everybody was talking about Borat 2. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not sure. Has anybody watched Borat 2 on here? I no. have not. <laughs> no. no. Uh, the comedy isn't for everyone. And uh, it's one of those movies where – I enjoyed it. I thought it was funny. It would also, it's one of those things too, where I'm not sure who I would necessarily recommend it to. I think you pretty much have to be a fan of the first one and his type of humor, uh, to enjoy in, to enjoy it. And I think a lot of people have already kind of seen the clips of Rudy Giuliani online and everything, but um, I'm actually going to go back a couple of years with, uh, Sasha Baron Cohen and recommend a show that he did on Showtime in 2018 called Who is America? So this was almost kind of like, like the official kind of 
follow up, if you will, to to Borat before we got uh, the sequel. So just like in Borat, he kind of exposes a lot of the ridiculousness uh, that is happening with American politics. Cohen kind of creates some new characters. Uh, one that I really liked was his name is Billy Wayne Ruddick. And you kind of see basically Billy Wayne Ruddick is kind of like this right wing blogger and everything. And you kind of see the look for Billy Wayne Ruddick in in uh, Borat too, because Borat kind of has to disguise himself because everybody knows knows who he is. He actually, as Billy Wayne Ruddock, he interviews Bernie Sanders, who I'm almost 100% sure was kind of in on the interview, but kind of Bernie Sanders kind of exposes why a lot of his questioning and some of, some of his talking points that you would hear on the news a lot were just kind of ridiculous and kind of debunk some of those um, some of those rumors that were that are going around and another character he came up with was uh colonel aaron uh morad who is like a former israeli uh soldier and was kind of now this uh bodyguard for hire and he actually interviews former vice president dick cheney on his show and uh, they're talking about security and all this other stuff and it's it's quite amusing if you're a fan of sasha uh, baron cohen definitely recommend you go and check it out if you're not you you probably won't enjoy it so i might only be speaking with a few a handful of listeners that might enjoy this one but uh we've got uh quite a few copies of it in our collection it's about six six or eight episodes each episode is only about a half an hour so you can probably watch it in a couple nights or on the weekend but uh yeah if you're looking for a laugh and you enjoyed the borat movies definitely check out who is america so there's a few uh political recommendations happening this week tis the season (laughs) very true exactly all right so let's get to why we're here today we're of course going to be talking about schitt's creek so just a word of warning, I guess, like if you haven't watched Shit's Creek yet, I mean, there's a good chance we could. Potential for spoilers. Potential yeah, for spoilers. Ex- yeah, exactly. Let's play uh, the t- sound clip anyway. Go Spoiler. ahead. Spoiler exactly. Alert. There it is. And uh, yeah, so if you haven't watched it, maybe you want to maybe skip this episode, watch some, and then come back and, and listen to this episode again. Yeah, you definitely can. But uh, before we start talking about it, I want to share a little bit of uh, trivia with our listeners. So uh, the show debuted on February 11th, 2015 on CBC and had uh, a total of 80 episodes over six seasons. The final episode just aired earlier this year on April the 7th. And of course, uh, what a lot of people know already is a few months ago, it set an Emmy record for most wins in a single season for a comedy series with nine. It was also the first series to sweep the four major acting categories that same year. And uh, the show, of course, is a family affair as it was created by father and son actors, Eugene and Dan Levy. Uh, Eugene's daughter, Sarah Levy, uh, plays uh, Twyla and his brother, Fred Levy, is also a producer on the show. Uh, One of everybody's favorite characters, of course, is Alexis Rose, but actress uh, Annie Murphy almost didn't play her. In an unaired pilot, actress Abby Elliott, who's the daughter of Chris Elliott, uh, played Alexis, but when the show got picked up, uh, she was attached to another project and couldn't commit to the series. And uh, the fictional town of Schitt's Creek is actually located in Orangeville, Ontario. Caroline, you're from Ontario. Have you ever been to Orangeville? I have not. <laughs> so I can't comment on on what they did during uh, any of the the filming. Uh, nor will I say whether or not Schitt's Creek bears any resemblance to the small town where I grew up. But uh, I will say that I did enjoy the show quite thoroughly. I think we all have aspects of the show that we really liked. When did you start watching the show, and were you hooked immediately, Katie? That we'll start with you. Uh, I was not hooked immediately. I took a couple runs at this show, and I think it was because I I wanted to like this show. Like, I was committed to liking this show, and I just had to be in the right headspace to get there. But I was going to keep trying until I loved it, because I love these actors. I love Canadian comedy. I love Canadian TV. I like supporting it when I, when I like it. So I... Uh, <laughs> 
So I was determined to like it. And so I started watching it when I was on maternity leave. So probably about 2018. But then it was 2019 where I really like binged through it and then watched it like right to the end of the series at the beginning of 2020. And yeah, I, I rewatched some favorite episodes this weekend in anticipation for this discussion. And I just, I think it bears rewatching. I think it's definitely a rewatchable show and I will continue to probably watch it for a long time. Can you imagine what it would have been like without Annie Murphy as Alexis? No, I do like the the Elliot connection. Like if there'd been another father daughter piece, um, because I like that aspect of it, all the levies in the show. But I love Annie Murphy. I love Alexis, the way she sort of developed and how Annie Murphy kind of grew that character. I wouldn't change that for anything. Yeah. Bryce, how about you? I was late to the show. And to be honest with listeners, I actually didn't start watching this show until I knew that we were going to be talking about it on Overdue Fine. So I've only really been watching it for the last month or so. And as a matter of fact, I'm not even finished the show. I'm uh, partway through season two, but I can honestly say I'm liking it a lot more than I thought I was going to. For reasons we're going to get into later in the show, I was hesitant in watching it. I think just because it was, and this is going to sound terrible, because it is a Canadian show, and I know that's I know that's awful, but also, too, it's one of those things, too, where I remember seeing ads for it originally, and I was like, oh, the, you know, the title sounds funny, and it's funny because I remember seeing a clip with uh, Catherine O'Hara, who brilliantly plays Moira, and just the the tone of her voice, I was like, oh, I don't, I did, I, I don't know why, I just didn't like kind of her voice. So right away, that kind of turned me off originally of not after not even watching a single episode. And it's awful on purpose. Like I think that's oh, yeah. by design. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. But I don't like I said, I just didn't really speak to me for whatever reason. And then uh, you know, I kept hearing from her from everybody that the show was hilarious. Um, and of course, longtime listeners know in March Madness uh, tournament, it almost won this year. So that kind of also kind of helped bring me back around to it being like, you know what? Okay, Bryce, like it's time you actually sit down and enjoy the show and, or just to watch the show. And I can honestly say that I've been, I've been loving it. I've been, uh, been watching an episode or two almost every day, uh, over the last couple of weeks. And, uh, it's, it's hilarious. And it's one of those shows uh, similar to breaking bad where I came to it late and I'm almost kicking myself for uh, not giving it a chance earlier on. Now, March it was a long time ago, especially this year. Um, but Bryce, if I remember, you were kind of surprised that it did so well in, yeah. in March Madness. It won the television bracket and then beat out, I can picture it on the thing, it beat out the one that was underneath it to make it to the final round against Harry Potter. Yeah, I think it beat like Beyonce or something, the music no, by Beyonce. No, because someone beat Beyonce, didn't Oh, yeah. They? Okay, remember. we'll have to go back through our own records. But, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, but yeah, it was in the, it was in the finals against uh, Harry Potter, and it was also a, a close close vote. And I mean, looking back on it now, I think actually, I think now if we had had that tournament over the last couple of months, I think it would have beat Harry Potter, and not just because of all the controversy right now with J.K. with J.K. Rowling. I think you know a lot of people have really discovered the show with it being on Netflix and, and streaming services um, that may, maybe not didn't get a chance to watch it before. Yeah, what an I, apples and oranges pairing, hey? Like Harry Potter and Schitt's Creek, you could not <laughs> pick two more different things. I kind of love that. Yeah, <laughs> that was one Caroline. of the really good parts about March Madness this year was we had some interesting matchups. Mm -hmm. I uh, also came to the show late. I just recently started watching it. I, it's hard. It's so hard to say when I got hooked because it was kind of this artificial watching experience of going in, knowing we were going to be talking about it on the show, knowing that it had hit March Madness. My parents watched it earlier in the year and became obsessed with this show. <laughs> and I know that they are listening today, partly because they listened to all of the Overdue Finds episodes, but mostly because we are specifically talking about shit's 
Creek. There were weeks where my mom would give me updates on what Daniel Levy was doing as if it was someone she knew. And she just wanted me to know what he was up to and what she had found on the internet because she just really got attached to the characters. And I think that I've heard that when you're watching it, the, the, the common kind of description of it is give it some time because if you're not immediately in but it kind of shifts over time too from the immediate fish out of water rags to riches almost it reminded me a lot of arrested development actually yeah. with the way that you know a family has lost everything and there and there's one kind of character trying to keep it all together but then i would say after season 2 there's really kind of a a flip where it becomes less about like, how are they getting out of this town? And more, who who are these people now? So I think that, I mean, I've talked a little bit about this on the show, that when it comes to what I like to read and watch, I'm a character reader. And this show is perfect for that because the characters are so vibrant. And they grow. Like, there's development in every single character, even minor characters. Um, you yeah. can really root for their journeys because they're all on very, very clear and I don't know, they're just exciting journeys. Like they're they're going through yeah. discovery and change and learning and it's it's nice. Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned that, Caroline, because as somebody who isn't finished the whole series yet, like I know what happens in the show, but and it's fine. I'm I'm enjoying the ride right now. But just from you know stuff I've seen, like promo images and how the show ends, and only being in the middle of season two, as I'm watching this, I'm like, this show at some point changes a lot. Like it seems like it will change a lot. So it's interesting to hear that. Yeah, like it goes from and the episodes I'm on right now are like we got to sell this town. We got to get out of here. And so, yeah, it's, it's really refreshing to hear that uh, there's a little, there's a lot to these characters and that they, you know, everybody seems to really go on this really big uh, journey and there's a lot of personal growth for everyone involved. Yeah. So with the show, Katie, what are everybody's uh, favorite episodes? I have so many. I have so many. <laughs> and I was sort of skipping through trying to watch like my favorites from each season over the weekend to kind of get refreshed. I do think I know where I, I think the reason I took a few runs at it is that, yeah, you do need to give it some time and you need to get to know the characters and you need to get past like, these characters are annoying on purpose and you need to kind of get through that to sort of see why it's like that and how they grow past that. And for me, the turning point was the episode, it's the ninth episode of season one called Carl's Funeral. And there are so many things about that that crack me up, including the way that small towns are about people dying. I think that they did a really amazing job where, you know, the shits show up at the motel and say, well, well, Carl died. And the roses are like, who? Like, I don't care. And like my small town in-laws will text me to tell me that the person who owned the gas station in this small town, three towns over, passed away. And isn't that sad? And I'm like, who? And it's just, it's such a real representation of our small town experience. And then everything about that, everything from like, oh, he admired you so greatly. You have to be a pallbearer, his fake back pain. I can't be a pallbearer. Great. Then you can give the eulogy all the way to like singing at the funeral. It gets dark. It's one of those, it's one of the episodes. And there are a few where like the comedy actually gets quite dark when they start sort of joking about how Carl may or may not have died. But, but it's kind just, of through the innocence. Yeah, like they're, totally. Like, and this is, I think, a really key piece with the series as a whole. Like where there, there are jokes, but wh who's making the joke and who's the butt of the joke? Small towns and like the people in them are sometimes the subject of the joke, but not always. And with and that, it's, it's and it's not mean, right? Yes. Like it's it. They can sort of pull up the magnifying glass and take a close look at look at these so somewhat absurd realities about small town life or about this tension between maybe the haves and have nots or whatever it is, but it's not mean spirited. And it's something I actually think Canadian comedy does well. When I think about a show like Kim's convenience as well, where they're looking at race and the newcomer experience and they're making that funny, but it's not mean. It's, it's more like a close look at like, look at these experiences we're all having. 
we can laugh about it together, but no one's the victim of that. And I think the show also does that really, really well. Yeah. And that's definitely a road that depending on who the writers were, they could have easily gone down that road of, and just kind of made the show very mean, mm-hmm. almost as almost in like a reverse Beverly Hill hillbillies type of yeah. way. Mm-hmm. And it would have maybe been funny for a few episodes, but uh, ultimately it just would have kind of uh, wore out its welcome, I think. And um, I think that's, I recently talked about the office on the show and we can kind of make comparisons there because the first kind of season you have this character, Michael Scott, and he is, he's a jerk. Like he, he is like mean, but you know, the writers of that show also realized that, you know what, we have to have some heart in here. And that's ultimately kind of what helped save the office as, as well. And what's kind of helped make it be such this beloved show. And it's funny because as I've, I've, as I've been watching Shit's Creek, I can't help but kind of compare, compare the two. And, um, that's definitely, yeah, I, I think that's why a lot of people have enjoyed it because there is this, this heart at the center of the show and it's, it's not a mean comedy at all. It's another thing I think you you brought up Arrested Development as a as sort of similar the bones of it feel similar, yeah. but Arrested Development is a little bit well meaner a little bit I mean it's a great show and I love it and it's a smart show and it's a funny show but it doesn't have the heart that you're talking about like this show just has that you just you're rooting for everybody and it's I mean I, I was going to talk about this later but I just think at its core this is a show about love in a million different ways and like Arrested Development is not a show about love and I think that's the difference and even though if you read a synopsis it's a it's a similar well the the bones are similar but it, it plays out in a totally different way yeah so you mentioned you have a couple of favorite episodes. Do you have another uh, favorite episode you want to share? When they find <laughs> when they find David at the beginning of season two, like I die when he's sitting in the I I I don't know if we want to like I don't want to wreck that if someone hasn't experienced that. But the first episode of season two, when they ultimately find him, I think that's amazing. I love in season three when they get the giant portrait back. I that episode is hilarious and also i think kind of a turning point where they're gonna like they they kind of make the call to to give up their old life in a way i love that episode i love when alexis graduates from high school and moira at grad i that is an amazing episode the open mic night like talk about heart i can't i mean like honestly i could talk for this whole hour about all my favorite episodes but (laughs) and then of course uh the episode that's called hospies but the the second the second uh, plot line is Alexis auditioning for Cabaret, which is where we get a little bit of Alexis, which has become its own thing. And Annie Murphy's actually like written the rest of that song and produced a video for it. I mean, it's the best thing on Canadian TV ever. I, I'm I'm prepared to say maybe not, but I love that <laughs> so much, so so much. So I mean, really, I've got like I've got like three in every episode that are my favorite, in every season that are my favorite episodes. So we, yeah. we should mention that a little bit of Alexis was the song from her critic critically reviewed critically reviewed re- yes reality show and it's like it, that's that's the stuff that i love about this like there it, it's i mean i don't want to i don't it's a cliche to say like it's working on so many levels because that's what tv as a medium is does but to have something where there's the the ongoing story the specific words the visuals like they honestly and then the acting like all of these layers on top of it put together you could almost watch it um like once through with like no sound on and just watch some of the gestures the body language they all have very specific ways of being on screen and that's why as I was making notes for today's episodes there were some that I was like I would get into it and then realize like Caroline this is a conversation you're not writing like a critical essay oh, I know. about I wrote about, so many notes about how they unfold the menus like the number of times yes. with the menus like we're yeah. not really going to talk about that but it's that kind of detail yeah yeah and that's the thing and like um i i knew this would come up but, but like there are just so many of those like ongoing um details and they're not running jokes because they never maybe in the pilot with the menus they call attention a little bit to the unfolding of it um and they've all squeezed into the booth but then there are other things that are just there as like parts of their life one of my favorite kind of running pieces is moira rose's sleepwear 
like she puts on her pajamas and then she adds a vest and the vest has a brooch. Like that is who she <laughs> is. And it's, it's, you know, there's, she talks a lot about like her wigs and her clothes and all of this and who, how her clothes make her who she is, but they never like really go into calling attention to that specifically. Um, Bryce, before I ask you, if you had a favorite episode, my TV nerd hat on, I want to say, uh, just going back to something you said earlier, that a reverse Beverly Hillbillies is actually a Green Acres. <laughs> oh, so, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yes. Good call there. So now I've got that off and can concentrate <laughs> on the rest of this conversation. But I'm going to be singing the Green Acres theme in my head now for the next three hours. So, <laughs> yeah. So you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Bryce, did you have have you had a favorite episode of the ones you've watched so far? Uh, yeah, so out of the ones I've watched, my favorite one is I think it's like maybe episode nine or something like that in season one. It's the surprise party. Oh yeah. So this is this is the one where Johnny wants to plan a birthday part a birthday party for uh, Moira, but of course they have to let her know that it's a fundraiser. She's all about fundraisers and she wants to be involved though in the planning of the fundraiser which of course is her own surprise party and so for a little bit she's kind of helping plan her own surprise party before they let her in on uh, the secret but it's so funny too just because when she's she's chatting with everybody and she's like where well where's your event plan and <laughs> these flowers won't do and it's it's just really really funny and also too the one thing i really like during that episode was i think any other show they would have had maybe moira just be kind of disappointed with how the party looked and the decorations and everything but you know what she she really accepted it all she was so happy to see all these different people from the town come together for her birthday everybody was having a great time at the party it wasn't like a disaster so yeah i for me so far that's been my favorite favorite episode Caroline, do you have a favorite episode so far? I uh, there's an episode. I think it's season two. It's called Lawn Signs, and which calls attention to Moira's political campaign. But my favorite part of that has to do with takeover at the Blouse Barn, which is <laughs> and again spoilers. David is working at the Blouse Barn in Elmdale, and he's made some changes to the to the environment. But the owner tells him that she's going to have to let him go. But it's it's okay because the store is being bought out for their name this australian company wants their name and he sort of realizes that this gives the blouse barn and the the owner of it an opportunity to maybe get a bit more than they're offering and so he appears kind of as her as her representative brings alexis who takes on the persona of angelica bloomfield who has a high fashion pony which gives the impression that she is a lawyer and she's not and uh, just to clear clarify but it's there are some really good scenes in that playing off the the different areas of expertise that people have as well it ends in a win and i think it's really important as much as the characters need to have these things that they're overcoming or changing or learning there there are tons of things that don't go their way or or end up more difficult than they thought it would be but when they when they have a win there's something really sweet about it and to have a win out of like skill and ability especially where this sets up for david and where the, he then can go uh, with taking some of this money that he ends up with and and turning that into his next initiative which then gets him introduced to patrick who becomes a major character it's just a really really important episode for for where david's journey is so glad you mentioned the blouse barn because I re a recent episode I watched, Moira finds out about the blouse barn and just the way she says, like, I will never shop at the blouse <laughs> barn. <laughs> yeah. <It's> so funny. <laughs> yeah. Katie, you mentioned the show as about love. And when we asked staff here at EPL what they liked about Schitt's Creek because we went on the assumption that there would be some people in a staff of 600, 700 that, that enjoyed 
the show. And one of the answers we got was from Allison, who says that as a member of the queer community, having a show like Shit's Creek that normalized queer characters without adding a previous trauma was refreshing. Typically, queer characters are depicted only with a traumatic past and makes it seem like the character is LGBTQ2S plus because of that trauma. Dan Levy's creativity with the characters, wardrobe selections, and development of the storylines is really what makes this show special. You mentioned that there is love in many different forms on this show. Do you see that as being one of the factors that resonates? Yeah, completely. I think it I think that's it. I think that comment is so so telling that that it's telling love stories without it being like, you know, an after school special queer storyline love story. It's inclusive without hitting you over the head. It's just it just is. It's just they're a part of this world and all of the relationships that are in this show are included as an absolutely mainstream part of this experience it's you know whether it's David and Patrick whether it's Alexis and Mutt or Alexis and Ted whether it's between all the various roses right so between Moira and Johnny between them and their children the sibling relationship I've always found really interesting because you know they seem to live totally separate lives but then they'll have these references together where they've actually clearly grown up together and and how that plays out and i mean i am always fascinated to hear about how like adult siblings relate to one another and i think that they do a good job of that as well the love between johnny and stevie and how they develop as a partnership at the motel patrick and his parents and the way the coming out story unfolds there um there's just so much and everything even Bob and his wife who we never meet and he's always on the phone with Gwen and like there's so many love stories and I think I think too that I mean without getting too schmaltzy about it I think that like the the Levies are writing a love story to to Canada to small towns Eugene Levy has said that he wanted to raise his kids not in like a Hollywood environment and I think that this is a bit of of that story as well so early on in the in the series where uh david and stevie are involved in in a little bit of a relationship david uh, the way he explains being a pansexual i thought was was absolutely perfect where he was talking about the wine and how sometimes he likes a rosé and then sometimes he likes this or sometimes you know he likes that and just the way it was handled um in that in that episode was uh was absolutely brilliant and i don't know please correct me if i'm wrong but i'm sure there has been other pansexual characters on other tv shows but um i couldn't i couldn't think of any when i was watching this it was a very positive uh, portrayal and uh it was you know as allison mentioned it was great that um there wasn't this kind of traumatic backstory with it it's a joyful love story Everyone mm-hmm. deserves a joyful love story and telling that story and not making it an issue story, but just making it a joyful love story is what makes it inclusive. Mm-hmm. Especially when we get to the the David and Patrick relationship, which doesn't start out super smoothly, but it, but it, you know, they have things that they, they face and they're, they're both bringing their past into this relationship, but there's, there's a real kind of sweetness about something that I believe Moira says to David around, he sees you, he sees you for who you are. And that's a really important piece of this show, uh, these characters being who they are and finding love or being open to the different forms of love that exist there. I also love that Moira and Johnny are deeply in love. They dis- have disagreements, they can bicker, they uh, they're they're sometimes like fed up with each other, but at their core they are not like over this relationship. They are deeply deeply for each other. And I just love seeing that as are you know, Roland and Jocelyn. We did, as Caroline, as you mentioned, we did kind of reach out to EPL staff to get them to kind of share uh, why kind of this show resonated with so many people. So I thought we could kind of uh, wrap up our Shit's Creek talk and just kind of 
reflect on what some of the staff said. So I want to just kind of mention, similar to what you, what everyone was just talking about, uh, Kyle Burley, one of our colleagues here, he mentioned, uh, obviously, David and Patrick's story is beautiful, important, and in many ways, the heart of the show. But my favorite relation, relationship is the mentorship slash surrogate father-daughter dynamic between Johnny and Stevie. Here are two characters with seemingly nothing in common who found in each other exactly the person they needed to help them start believing in themselves so yeah i thought that was that was a great feedback from kyle andrea mentioned that uh she one of the things that drew her to the show was that there was so much diversity in the small town gay lesbian unapologetically single older lonely marriages that worked marriages that didn't it's funny. She adds that the small town Canada casserole recipes were familiar to most of us and added to the comfort of watching it. The costuming was outstanding and unique to every character. Nobody will ever forget David Rose sitting in the field of the Amish family's home in that hoodie with the zebra like fringe at the top. Katie, I also want to share with our listeners who cannot see you that you fully committed to our episode oh, yeah. today. Mm-hmm. And could you tell them a little bit about what you're wearing? Well, just so that I could be fully inspired for this discussion, I grabbed today and put on a black and white striped sweater, sort of big uh, horizontal stripes, because really black and white stripes, black and white in general is the palette for uh, for David and for Moira most of the time as well. And I read somewhere that for Moira in particular, the stripes are a callback to her role in Beetlejuice. I don't know if I believe that, but I love Beetlejuice too. Uh, so I'm, I'm representing the black and white stripes today. Unfortunately, as it's a podcast, you're all going to have to miss out on that. But just know I look the part. <laughs> that is what's in the background fueling all of us reading today and you mentioned Catherine O'Hara in Beetlejuice I love her in Home Alone of oh, course so like she has so many great she, roles Sally in The Nightmare Before Christmas which like yeah. people don't expect and don't remember but like so Catherine O'Hara is in half of my favorite movies easily easily she owns <laughs> this kind of like October to December time period yep. and that's something Chantal mentioned the chemistry between the actors was topped here and every single single character gave us a master class in honest earnest character work and really inhabiting your character i think some of that comes from you know the actors being related to each other or in the case of eugene levy and Catherine o'hara having worked together over the years but i mean the actors in this are just amazing you just you just experience where they go with things and i think i mean we can't we can toss that out as one of the appeal factors as well. And I have thought about the sort of the storyline of them leaving their, their wealth and celebrity and going to this small town. It feels a little bit like, you know, our, our comedians coming home as well. They've gone off, they've made it big. They've done John Hughes movies, they've done whatever. And now they're home in small town Canada and we're welcoming them back. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. All right. So we talked about this at the top of the show, too, that, you know, Canadian TV in general, uh, obviously Schitt's Creek is really kind of has been the basis for today's discussion. So, Katie, what are some of your all time favorite Canadian shows besides Schitt's Creek? Besides Schitt's Creek. I, I mean, I love Canadian comedy. And since we're talking about these actors, I think we have to talk about SCTV. Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara, obviously, but John Candy, uh, Martin Short. Andrea Martin I'm forgetting the list is like a dozen people long but uh, that they weren't at all Joe Flaherty they weren't all Canadian um, but it came out of Canada and then went broader and some of it was really Canadian and one of my favorite (laughs) character sketches uh, out of SCTV was Bob and Doug McKenzie and their hoser Canadian I don't know what it was supposed to be like a talk show or whatever, but yeah, they great white North, great white North. And, um, and that, I think that we see some of that coming through all the way to Schitt's Creek, you know, 40 years later, but that being able to kind of poke fun of the stereotypes in a way that we all relate to and, and love. Um, I mean, I still listen to them and their 12 days of Christmas and like Bob and Doug are classic and that's Rick Moranis and Dave Thomas. And that's where this is coming out of it. I think that there's such 
a rich history of Canadian comedy that then takes us to today where we're having a bit of a golden age where we have Schitt's Creek, but things like Kim's Convenience and Working Moms and CBC has got a good set right now of of comedy shows that are sort of punching above where CBC often hits. And I think it's great. I think that they're relatable. I think it's I think it's really important to see our stories on TV because we see a lot of American media and we see a lot of those cultural stories. And obviously there are similarities, but, you know, it's good to see those uniquely Canadian stories reflected back to us as well. Interesting. You mentioned SCTV few months ago, actually, it's probably been about six months ago, we actually recorded interview uh, because uh, one of the seasons of SCTV was actually filmed here in Edmonton at Global Studios. At Global, yep. So we actually, yeah, so we actually interviewed a couple of the crew members. And our plan is to kind of release that episode around the time that uh, the SCTV documentary directed by Martin Scorsese is finally released on Netflix. So we can't wait to share that interview with you uh, with all of, all of the listeners and everything. It was uh, great to get some uh, inside info on that. Caroline, uh, mm-hmm. how about you? Uh, you? I'm sure you've got some different uh, Canadian shows you really enjoyed. I watched a ton of television in my life. And starting as as a child, there were so many great kids shows that were on at the time that I was growing up. Today's special is one that, thank God for the internet, because if you were trying to describe this show to someone, you know, there's this mannequin that comes to life and a mouse that speaks in rhyme and a security card and he's a puppet, but not everyone's a puppet, but he's a human. Is one of them Alex Trebek? Like, (laughs) (laughs) It's just... A show that I watched a ton of as a kid. It was where I was introduced to Oscar Peterson, who was my overdue finds pick from a few weeks ago. They had these little um, cutaways that were hosted by Mime Lady, this woman who never spoke. You know, again, like this sounds like I'm on some kind of trip when I'm describing this. But today's special, um, of Mr. Dress Up, Sharon, Lois, and Bram. I was going to say, Elephant Show and Today's Special were always back to back. So you got both the fever dream of Today's Special and then you had Sharon Lois and Bram right next yeah yeah and which was you know more grounded perhaps in the real world but then there was also this giant mute elephant that they hung around with a lot of singing emphasis on imagination and storytelling coming through in these shows and of course something like Mr. Dress Up or Fred Penner band Generations people growing up at different times could experience that I think that Canadian media really grew out of the fact that there were not that many options. And I think that historically, something like like Wayne and Schuster was something that people watched, and then it became part of you know, the lexicon of of references. I know that, you know, my parents and I quote, you know, specific sketches from Wayne and Schuster. And I said to him, Julie, don't go. Is it that one? It it it, it is, in fact, that one. <laughs> um, but, you know, and, and it's something they watch. It was airing in reruns on the Comedy Network when, you know, I was a teen. So it, it's just been there. Degrassi, the original incarnations as well as the the later ones i think there was a time in the like 90s 2000s where you know you'd watch this hour has 22 minutes and there would be like a very funny political joke and you'd watch it and go like ooh burn <laughs> like and, and and Royal Canadian them. Air Force too right Royal Canadian Air Force came up through the radio uh, and made the jump to TV and and for a while in the 90s Air Force and 22 minutes were like surprisingly hilarious Canadian political sketch comedy like that's yeah. that's wild oh yeah you'd be listening you'd be watching and be like ooh take that Manitoba yeah <laughs> it's like watch out Preston Manning like oh my god <laughs> his reform party I knew more about like premiers of random other provinces and things watching those shows than I do now and I mean I consider myself a pretty engaged and informed person politically but but like that was how I got some of my news 
Absolutely. And then there's the 80s, 90s, 2000s. BuzzFeed every now and then will show a map and it's like, this is the most popular X set in this state and like show a map of these. So you have things like the road to Avonlea representing for for PEI, North of 60, Republic of Doyle, Canadian television that was, even though it's from Canada, it feels a little other and sometimes especially you know now I think we get to have more like own voices involved in the production of that so that Kim's Convenience is being created by people with that kind of background and experience and it's not so much being told by the same voices on it but Canada has had these shows that reflect the diversity of living in Canada. Mm -hmm. Uh, A couple shows too I want to give a shout out to First one, I'm surprised neither of you mentioned it, was The Raccoons. It's on my list. It's on oh, my list. Okay. The Raccoons <laughs> was, oh my God. Like, you know, we were we were talking more about the like puppet-based children's shows. Mm, but when it yes. comes to cartoons, Raccoons was amazing. I still talk about Raccoons. Yeah. Ab- absolutely. Uh, the only thing, though, I'm kind of mixed on The Raccoons about was I loved watching The Raccoons. However, I knew once The Raccoons were over, it was like bedtime and it was like... Monday, like I'd go back to school the next day. So the raccoons was like officially the end of the weekend. Another show too. And we wouldn't, in my opinion, have something like working moms if it wasn't for kids in the hall, hall. which uh, I was such like an edgy, edgy show. And it was so much different than what you were typically seeing. And it was on CBC. Like, yeah, it's just totally something you would not normally see on. Yeah. CBC or really any Canadian show in general. And I remember watching it as a young kid, probably way too young to be watching it, but like, I didn't get half. I didn't get probably like 90% of the jokes, but the stuff that did, it was just so like, so different like um the character with like the cabbage head and just you know i'm crushing crushing your head and all that other stuff like it was it's totally groundbreaking and i will also say as somebody who loves tv theme music kids in the hall has in my opinion the best tv theme wrong. music ever wrong that goes oh, to wrong. another that goes to another canadian tv show and i mean i've already like i'm singing the wayne and schuster song i'm singing i've gone through <laughs> a bunch while we've been sitting here but that goes to the littlest hobo. Yeah. Yeah. Like Bryce is like really reluctantly um, acknowledging that Katie may have a point <laughs> on that yeah. one. Also littlest hobo too. Also one of my, one of my absolute favorites as a kid. But I just want to go back to talking about the CBC a little bit. I mean, I'm, I am a born and bred CBC fan. I can't deny that. But I it think sounds people, like you were born in the CBC. I'm sure that CBC radio was playing as playing. I like, came to Entered the world. The world. But, <laughs> but I, you know, we, we say that like, you know, it's hard to believe that something like Kids in the Hall was on CBC. I think we think of CBC as what I call the mom mystery shows, right? Like Murdoch mystery, Frankie Drank mysteries, even Republic of Doyle, the sort of wholesome mysteries that everybody's moms watch. And like Murdoch Mysteries have got like 15 seasons and it's it's like a great family sort of, you know, like it's just it's just wholesome. But CBC, I think because of the fact that it gets arts funding and it doesn't have to rely on ad dollars in the same ways, it it can take some of those risks. And I think that's why we see some of these comedy, especially coming up through the CBC, because that's what it's for. It's for incubating art in creative and new ways and taking chances on things. And I think that that's something that's really, really valuable culturally. And that ties into something that you mentioned at the top of the show, Bryce, and on the last episode, which was that you were hesitant to watch Schitt's Creek at first because it was a Canadian show. Yeah. Can you explain yourself? (laughs) How dare you? (laughs) I I don't think I'm the only person who feels this way. And I think, Katie, you touched on this earlier about how, you know, we're neighbors with the U.S. and the U.S., you know, turns out Hollywood turns out all these amazing shows every year, movies, TV shows. And the production value is just obviously top notch on it just because there's a lot more money going into those shows. But I think part of it too, just with being Canadian is a lot of these shows just have that, you know, this is clearly Canadian. And I think sometimes you can kind of look back on that and just be like, Oh, like we're maybe this is, this isn't, 
you know, it's a little bit cheaper than what you would see coming out of Hollywood. Maybe the production value isn't, isn't quite as good. You know, even stuff like the humor, like Canadians, you know, we all have a very dry sense of humor and just stuff is just a little bit different. And I don't think, you know, I think in general, a lot of people are like, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a Canadian show. And I, I think it's unfortunate, but I think we are, thanks to shows like Shit's Creek, Kim's Convenience, even something like Corner Gas, probably from oh, 10, yeah. 15 years ago, yeah. like that really helped rejuvenate Canadian media and how people view Canadian television. And uh, which is, which is good. And it's sadly, there is a, still a lot of people like myself who are still a little reluctant to kind of dip our toe into the you know the new canadian shows uh when they come out another show too that i really actually enjoyed uh, that came out i think probably 10 years ago was uh mr d starring yeah. comedian jerry d was also a really funny show and sometimes i know there's other people like me out there who <laughs> Bryce, kind of... did you did you ever get into trailer park boys i feel like you would love trailer park boys you know what no actually i tried watching trailer yeah. park boys and i just didn't like it one of the shows i did like and fr- my friends and i will kind of debate about this too is i loved kenny versus spenny mm. which is also another canadian show which i probably can't talk about too many of the episodes on on this show but there's lots of fans of of that one too letter kenny is another one yep. too that's really popular i've i just haven't been able to get into it but um you know what i tip my hat now to uh to all the canadian series they've definitely earned my respect well and it's interesting too because there are tons of series that are like joint productions and a lot of shows are made in canada that we maybe don't realize it that wouldn't be considered low production value. All of Supernatural is filmed in Canada. Vikings mm-hmm. is filled between Canada and Ireland. Winona Earp had a bit of that in the beginning, that kind of cringy, like, oh, this was clearly filmed in Calgary, and I think you could do better. <laughs> but Man Did It Pick Up, also starring, uh, oh, I don't know his name, but he was much shit in Shit's Creek. Um, he's Doc Holliday in Winona mm-hmm. Earp. But there's a ton, Stargate, the Stargate series was, um, there's a ton of, productions that aren't exactly like they're not like your cbc homegrown production but we're producing in canada and what isn't winnipeg like the chicago of the north everyone comes to film in winnipeg because it has some you know streets that kind of feel like some of the historic cities in the states and so there's an interesting kind of thing going on too where like actually a lot of those flashy shows are being produced right here anyway. Speaking of filmed in Calgary, I just want to give a quick shout to one of my newer favorite shows, which is Jan, the CTV sitcom that is kind of a mock take on the life of Jan Arden as she deals with being an aging Canadian minor celebrity and (laughs) her family and tries to keep her career afloat. It's hilarious. I love it. I love Jan Arden. It's currently airing its second season on CTV and filmed in Calgary. Another show too filmed in Calgary I've talked a lot about on this show. One of my favorites, Fargo. Uh, I don't think the latest season with Chris Rock was uh, filmed there, but I know uh, parts of the, definitely the first season was filmed in Calgary. And I think maybe the third one was as well. But, and then second season, part of it was filmed in uh, Fort McMurray in Southern Alberta. So yeah, lots of fantastic shows are filmed in Calgary and uh, it's great too that so many Canadians who work on the crews can uh, can earn a living uh, making fantastic shows here. I think it's worth noting too and I have to say I'm not an expert in this but there's amazing TV coming out of the Indigenous community. APTN mm-hmm. this year CBC has launched the show Trickster to rave reviews. It's stacking up on my PVR but I haven't watched it yet and there's just speaking of that having you know, authentic local stories reflected back. That's really important. And I think that's something that comes out of Canada really strongly as well. So before we get to our roundtable questions, Bryce, what will we be talking about on our next episode? <laughs> Caroline, this is going to be a good one. Today's episode I've I've loved, and I think listeners are going to like it, but I think we're going to speak to kind of maybe a certain demographic of listeners here in, in the next one. I can't believe we're already talking about Christmas. It's just around the corner. And over the last few years, we've seen the rise in popularity of Hallmark Christmas movies. So on our next episode, we're going to be chatting about why they're so popular and some of our favorite of those movies. And joining us to talk about these movies will be official friend of the show and EPL librarian Beth Kilfoy and romance author and screenwriter 
Jennifer Snow. Uh, Beth and Jennifer, Caroline, before you took over co-hosting duties, um, I, of course, co-hosted an episode with Beth and Jennifer, and we chatted about uh, romance novels. And to date, it's one of my all-time favorite uh, episodes of Overdue Finds. And uh, yeah, we're going to be chatting all about uh, those romantic Hallmark Christmas movies. I'm really excited about this one. Cheryl is an expert. I almost feel like maybe she should be co-hosting this next episode with you, Caroline. Fun fact, in the spring, the Strathcona Library was a filming location for one such movie. Really? Yeah, I don't think it's been produced yet. And unfortunately, our shutdown happened before they could do any of the internal, like the interior filming. But (laughs) those viewers with a keen eye should spot EPL Strathcona branch, the exterior anyway, in uh, in an upcoming Christmas romance movie. Nice. Mm-hmm. Caroline, uh, Katie, are you both fans of the Hallmark Christmas movies? Yes. Very much so. Yes. yes. <laughs> it's it it, it we're we're nearly at that time. I'm not quite ready yet in the sort of second week of November to like dive into being pretty much all I watch, but we're, we're going to get there by the time we get to December. That's just on, you know, I'm baking Christmas cookies on wrapping Christmas presents on like they're just, they're just always on, but that's part of the appeal because they, you can yeah. just pick them up, right? You can catch it halfway through and it's sort of festive background noise. <laughs> uh cheryl's a huge fan i i can't say i am but it seems like i've watched pretty much most of them over the last few years because cheryl will have it on 24 7 as well so um yeah i'm really looking forward to chatting with uh, beth and jennifer about uh, about those a lot of those are canadian tv too canadian stars yes. canadian filming definitely so let's wrap things up with our roundtable questions. Uh, Katie, uh, you've been asked to give one of the members of the Rose family a ride into Elmdale. Which family member would you want to give a ride to? So I was thinking about this because Alexis is my favorite and I just, I love her. But then I was like, I think I would hate her if I was stuck in a car with her. Like, I'm not sure she's who I want to be driving around with. I think same goes for Moira. And then I was like, well, Johnny, I feel like I could maybe learn something from Johnny. He has like an interesting perspective. But then I decided I was going to break the mold altogether and I was going to take Jocelyn shit to Elmdale because she needs an outing more than anybody else. And she just needs like someone to have a good like girl chat with so i've decided i'm not taking anyone from the rose family i'm taking jocelyn to elmdale hopefully to get her hair done (laughs) they can borrow her car she'll ride with themselves and she's gonna ride with me she had to drive herself to deliver her baby like the woman needs a ride and a little bit of like a good time so yeah Caroline, how about you? Who are you giving a ride to? Well, I can't compete with that answer because I love it on so many levels. But uh, my choice for many of the same reasons as you went through the family members, I think David, because I think he would just kind of maybe be on his phone reading something and it would be mostly silent, but he might have like a strong opinion or two that we could get into. If I was in the exact right mood, I think it would be Alexis, but that is a very particular mood that you would have to be in for that to work what do you think bryce uh i went with the obvious one on this one i went with johnny i just think that maybe the other family members they would probably make fun of my choice of music that i would have on the radio i just think johnny would probably be able to have a pretty good conversation with i'd love to pick his brain about his past business i think that would be a really fun ride into elmdale yeah all right so we've recently seen a wave of tv reboots including coming up here caroline say by the bell and roseanne uh which canadian show would you like to see revived katie Breaker High. I think it's time for us to hit the high seas again. And I could just see, is it on your list too? I could just see that, you know, we have a group of good looking kids on a cruise ship doing their high school year, but also right now, more than in 1997, it only had one season in 1997, but anyway, more than in the nineties, they could be like eco warriors and they're out there like saving the ocean or something, but also it's like a teen drama. So they're falling in love and oh, yeah, I think we're ready for Breaker High 2.0. I'm a hundred percent with you. That was my my immediate first choice, and it's the number one on my list here. The only thing that gave me pause was thinking of the immediate current situation, which mm. is coronavirus. Mm. And if a cruise ship was really where we wanted to be. However, I do think that there is an opportunity for it to be some kind of wish fulfillment because I just love the idea of it being on a cruise ship. Uh, Another show, another TV show that had an iconic 
iconic opening theme song. Really well done all the way around <laughs> Breaker High. Um, so, so because I had some uh, hesitance around the health situation, I went with Street Sense. I want a reboot oh. of... I think it was the CBC kind of kids informational show about it was like, like a consumer, consumer report thing. Yeah. yeah. It's how I learned yeah. about the importance of like building a strong credit history. That segment stands out. That's I know got they... Jonathan Torrance too, isn't it? Didn't he come out of that yeah. and then got John yeah. vision and everything? Yeah. 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 And then there's a, an oral history of, I think, street sense that every time I come across it I end up sending to you because it's just so good and they but they talk I think it's Jonathan Torrance who mentions that he knew he had to get off the show when they were covering for like the third time why chip potato chip bags have so much air in them and he's like it's so they don't break (laughs) like get over (laughs) it and so he was like I think I need to move on from this but it's took kids and students seriously their concerns with their questions with their growing as consumers i think there could be an interesting street sense reboot sidebar jonathan torrance is the thing we have in canadian television in addition to road to avonlea from pei so you have road to avonlea (laughs) and jonathan torrance (laughs) nice bryce um, I totally forgotten all about street smarts until you uh, street mentioned sense. it. Yeah. Street, sorry, street sense. Yes. So obviously that's why I forgot all about it. <laughs> street um, smarts sm- sounds like like a like a stranger danger type show. Yes, definitely. Yeah. It's funny because originally my notes I had written down the littlest hobo. I would love to see a reboot of that. Everybody loves dogs, and it would just be. I think it would be an immediate hit, and you could have random Canadian celebrities come on. And kind of be part of the that episode that week, and the littlest hobo helps them out, and he he moves on, and we all shed a tear while that amazing theme music plays. But the more when we were uh, talking about this episode in Shit's Creek, the more I thought about how it would be amazing. And I'm stealing this idea from Corner Gas because they have the animated series. What if we did a prequel to Shit's Creek, but it was like an animated one when it shows the family with when they had all of their money so you have a little bit of johnny's business and you have uh alexis moira. being held hostage on a yacht somewhere exactly you have moira on the on the soap opera and, and david growing up as well i think there'd just be just an unlimited amount of episodes that could do there and just make them all animated and bring the cast back to uh voice the characters oh and we would also see johnny uh buying the town of Shit's creek in the first place would be a great episode which is something we didn't even talk about like the concept of like buying a town and and i know that it grew out of actual celebrities who in the 80s and 90s were doing this but that's how much there is to talk about on this show we didn't even talk about the idea of buying a town we didn't even talk about the welcome to Shit's creek sign which is like a whole oh, yeah. episode in itself like there's so much it's okay it's don't worry sister. this is his sister like yeah. it's so good <laughs> do you think if you take away the tension of them losing that life and them being sort of fish out of water that's as compelling like that those characters are as compelling i mean i I get what you're saying that there's lots of material because they lived a crazy crazy life but Mm -hmm. but do you think it's as endearing no i think it's a totally different show and that's why i think like it being animated would be really fun because yeah you have that stuff where you know alexis is held hostage and just you know the the inner workings of the family and everything and maybe some of the help around the house like uh, maybe it's got a little bit more of an edge to it but i think it'd be really entertaining or something different i think this is the order that you have to do them in like you couldn't start with them living their fabulous lives Mm. you need to kind of have them to know them through this experience and that's something i mean the closeness i especially through the first couple episodes i was trying to picture living with my adult sister next door to my parents in a motel for any length of time and Ooh, I don't think we could do it half as well as the roses do. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today, Katie. 
this has been simply the best. <laughs> is there anything that you want to let listeners know about, maybe about EPL or Strathcona before we wrap up? Well, we at Strathcona, like like the branches across the city, have been involved in supporting the online classes and events that are going on because we can't safely have uh, our regular story times and things happening in person in the branch. I just want to encourage everybody to check out what we have going on online. We've got some streaming like on Facebook Live, and we have others that you can register for and have a little bit more uh, personal engagement. So please check out all of the things that we've moved online so that we can keep providing those great classes and events while we can't yet do them in person. And if you go and visit Strathcona in person, if you're outside or next to the gazebo in McIntyre Park, you can pretend that you're in your own Christmas TV movie. That's right. We've mm-hmm. got a Christmas light lit gazebo which is just perfect for a first kiss if that works for you (laughs) we hope you've enjoyed today's episode if you haven't subscribed yet we encourage you to hit the subscribe button so that you automatically get new episodes please also leave us a review on apple podcasts and most importantly tell a friend about the show yeah please do and don't forget that we'll have a link to everything that we talked about in the show notes it'll be a lot a lot of links to uh, a lot of great canadian shows we would love to hear from our listeners and of course, you can reach us on Twitter at EPL.ca and use the hashtag EPL Overdue Finds. You can also email us any episode suggestions that you have at podcast at EPL.ca. 